Latecomers from some classes, which ends only around seven, but we start now. And first, I uh, so this is the this is the full performance of the heat speech monologues, which is an artistic response to prejudices, discrimination, and so-called hate speech here at CU. And first, I asked our rector and uh, president uh, Michael Ignatieff to say some welcoming remarks. Good evening. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted you can come. I brought my wife Susanna and my daughter Sophie here as a sign of my commitment to this. I want to thank Peter Molnar for years of doing this. Um, it's a very important thing for this university. Um, let's be frank, we're in a difficult environment in Budapest. And we're a very particular community. Um, I don't think there's any community in Hungary that is as diverse as we are. We come from every race and religion and creed and ideology and we come from so many nations, so many different backgrounds and we all end up in Karapeshi dorm and uh, we cook with each other and argue with each other and learn from each other. But I think sometimes we don't know what it's like to, to live and be inside the heads, the spirit, the souls of those who are right beside us. But a community can't be strong and we are a community, unless we understand each other as best we can. Not to reduce the differences, not to eliminate them, not to forget about them, but to celebrate and rejoice in them. Last week we had in this hall a moment where some members of our community felt disrespected by, by one of our speakers, just to give you an example. That was a difficult moment for many of our students who felt that their commitments, their identities, their ideologies, their views of the world were being disrespected by somebody invited by the university, invited by me. But we had the discussion. We listened. We talked. And we've moved forward together. This is how communities work. Um, I've talked about us a community as if we were bounded, but I also want to acknowledge that in the room there are a lot of people, members of the family, members of the Budapest community, people from outside. I want to welcome all of you. This is a community that is porous. We like to keep our boundaries very light. We want to be a community that welcomes everybody in Budapest, whatever their politics, whatever their views, and have an opportunity 
to spend an hour together listening to difference, understanding difference, thinking about what we're told. I was here last year with Susanna and it was one of the most memorable occasions of my academic year last year as your incoming president and I hope this one will be similarly memorable. Welcome to all of you and let the performance begin. Oh, and I forgot to thank you. This is the most important thing. Person M. Sapen, thank you all for doing this. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, Michael, for your kind and thoughtful words. I'm always thinking, listening to Michael, that he could easily participate in a slam poetry <laughs> event as a performer, also speaking freely and in an improvised, reflective manner with sense of humor and everything. Thank you so much again, also Zuzanna and also your daughter for coming. And uh, I would like to say just to continue a tradition that uh, it's uh, those of you who were here before knew that my mother was always here and she did a human rights cake and if someone tasted that cake then next day she or he had to be at the demonstration didn't wait for others to do all sorts of activities out of commitment and my mother is very sadly losing her vision now so she couldn't come and couldn't do the cake, but wonderful friends, Zsuzsa and Janusz came and Zsuzsa made some pogacsa, which I appoint now or ask to be human rights pogacsa, <laughs> so please taste that afterwards, but knowing that that means that you will have inside some sort of commitment from then on. And I don't want to talk too much now, I just mention that, as Michael said, this performance has been a tradition at CU since 2012 and 13, and with CU students we reflect on prejudices, and uh, all are welcome. The next performance will be in March. It's always different because performers are always speaking about their own experience in their own words. So, uh, those of you who wish to perform, uh, please approach me. And uh, I just would like to add that after the performance, there will be some time for questions and, uh, and uh, some discussion still in the room and afterwards a uh, uh, reception and I would like to thank very much Michael again for his support for that and uh, so uh, hopefully we will have a nice evening thinking, thinking about, about a difficult subject but in a fun way. Thank you, thank you so much. Hitler said in a speech in 1942 that there are countless Jews who are not laughing anymore. And there are some Jews who are still laughing but may not laugh any longer soon. And of course, part of the context in which he said it was the Nazi propaganda uh, main we hiding for was the infamous paper, the Stürmer, in which uh, one of the pictures was what you can see on the right, when Jews laugh. And 
there is hardly anything new under the sun, especially when it comes to what the potential monsters we human can produce. But the posters next to the one of the photographs next to the Sturmer image still makes you think that how, how is it possible? How is the founder of our university, George Soros, a Hungarian Holocaust survivor, can be portrayed on posters around our country as a laughing Jew? Not that there would be a problem if George or anybody else, Jewish or not, is laughing or have an ironic smile or even a sarcastic smile. But, of course, every word is contextual. And these posters are also contextual. And if we don't close our eyes, the context is what is next to the uh, poster from the Stürmer. And what is next to the Stürmer image is a photo which for which I thank a CU student, Randy Hahamovitz, who studies here at the Comparative History uh, Program. And he took that photo in a cemetery in Hungary, a Jewish cemetery at Szeged, in southeast Hungary. And as you see, his photograph captures one of the posters, which is sort of against George Soros over the graves of Jewish Hungarians. My name is Fanny, I come from Hungary, and my story won't be a, a very unique one, uh, especially in the context of Hungary, especially in the context of Budapest. I don't think so. So, I'm partly Jewish, um, my, um, actually, I can tell you, my, grandpa my grandparents uh, were Jewish and my uh, grandfather was in a labor camp in war in Serbia, but um, he came back uh, ever since he's deep-seated liberal and deep-seated uh, atheist and, um, and things are quite, quite, things are like quite happy for us. Uh, nevertheless, I, I always, I grew up knowing this. I, this was part of my identity, but it was never uh, very important as part of me. Uh, and um, I certainly didn't speak about it publicly, because my mother always used to say, please don't uh, promote it publicly. And for a long time, I didn't understand the why. My name is Antonio, I come from Venezuela, last July. I, I, had, I was looking for apartments to move because my contract expired and uh, I was very desperate because I, yeah, I, I didn't speak the language and I saw that, that the advertisements in foreign languages were three times more expensive than if you found them in Hungary so I, I hopefully found some Venezuelan Hungarian friends who helped me to, to call uh, apartment owners and speaking Hungarian and uh, at the beginning I was very surprised because I, I, they told me that they, in many cases they didn't want to, to, to rent apartments to foreigners but then they explained, they explained to me that it was because of tax reasons they wanted, it's a, it's a, it's a way to avoid taxes if you, because if you register in the migration office they, then they would need to pay taxes on the, on the income of the, for the apartments well, and then I became very desperate, and I I I, I hired a a, a, rent, a real estate agency who provided me with a list of apartments, and I was surprised because well, in the requirements, besides some of them, tell me that you know, that they don't rent it to people to people with kids, to people with pets, to smokers. But then here I got some of the emails that look like this list, everything in Hungary, but if you can see in the part that says Garzon, which means studio in Hungarian, 
and, and you see the requirements of that the owner of the apartment put, you can see, I received many of these, and it's, you can see I was very shocked when it said Roma name. So it's explicitly you receive a bunch of emails that if you are Roma, they don't rent the apartment to you. So basically, in this country, if you are Roma, if you are a foreigner, if you have pets, and, and if you have kids, forget about finding an apartment to live in. Jews, gays, and Roma should be gassed, said Yaroslav Stanik, the secretary of the ultra-right wing Czech Populist Party, Freedom and Direct Democracy, a few days ago. Long time ago, James Baldwin said, it's not the world that was my oppressor, because what the world does to you, if the world does it to you long enough and effectively enough, you begin to do it to yourself. Audrey Lord said, what are the words you do not yet, uh, what are the words you do not yet have? What do you need to say? What are the tyrannies you swallow day by day and attempt to make your own? until you will sicken and die of them, still in silence. White educated, better off people, calling, them, calling themselves ac academics, activists, feminists and leftists, try to shut my mouth when I speak about their self-centered racist perspective and practices while appealing, um, while with appalling identity politics and crucial freedom of speech, and I think how much it costs to speak when nobody else speaks. I also think how much it is charged when you do this among your people, who are also better off academics and activists and Roma. I cannot say how it would be if they are leftists though, simply because among these I did not met many leftists. While most of them see themselves as victims, mostly their status of academics and activists allows them to have decent jobs, houses, cars, and they do not really have this expression of recognition on their faces when I mention class and being better off. They run away from the talk about poverty and Roma. They say it produces stereotypes and instead they want to speak about successful Roma, preferably pictured in nice clean business suits or wearing flower patterned expensive pieces of clothing made by Roma entrepreneurs. If you break the rules of silence and openly disagree in a way that matters, it is too much. Maybe the most relevant cost of this too muchness these days is that you are deemed unworkable with. The, bo the bottom line is, the price you pay for breaking the well-established norm of being silent about the things that matter cashes out in quite measurable monetary units in poverty. I'm Esther from Hungary. Being a white European doesn't mean that you will not be discriminated. Just sometimes you don't realize it on the spot. Only a bit later, when you start, when you still think about the situation, why you feel bad about, why you felt bad about it. Yes, the puzzle can be solved. It can happen. It can still happen to you if you happen to be a woman in Hungary. I was even born as the first child into a family of engineers, but I had later two younger brothers. In my childhood, it seemed so obvious that I'm the one who can be asked to do the dishes, lay the table, and my brothers would do only occasionally any housework. That's where my family's tendencies are rooted. On one hand, ever since I've been very sensitive on any kind of discrimination, on the other hand, seeing my mother's past, I always felt that I can somehow overcome it. In my family, everybody's engineer, including my mother, who in the early 70s had to fight her way through the technical university almost exclusively among men. Often she was ashamed, summoned to the blackboard by the teachers to challenge her knowledge, and she had to prove at every exam that she knows the subject in spite of being a woman. Failing or giving up was not an option for her. No wonder that she became tough, tougher than any man in her grade, and finished university with honorable mention. She learned another thing well through this experience, that you have to be strong, stronger than all the others, and then nobody and nothing can stop you. 
She was among the first to start a private company at the System Change in Hungary. And even though they owned it jointly with my father, she was always the real boss for the mostly male employees. So I got a ra nice role model for myself. My partner doesn't appreciate it all the time. How on earth could she do that? Hey, I'm Ankita. I'm from India. Where are you from? Uh, hi, I'm Rahula and I'm from Pakistan. Oh, Pakistan. But um, where are you really from? Uh, I'm, I was seriously <laughs> telling you that I'm from Pakistan. Why would it be so strange for you? No, I mean, that's alright. But I mean, where are you originally from? Like China, Japan, or you know, Thailand? Uh, I'm from this uh, southwestern part of uh, Pakistan and I belong from this ethnic minority Hazara community. Uh, have you heard of it before? Um, I can't say I've ever really heard of it, no. So probably if you have ever come across news from Balochistan, the province I live in, uh, this ethnic uh, persecution of my community is going on. Thousands of people have been killed and a lot of people have had to flee the countries to take asylum. So where do they have to go? So most of them went to Australia, Europe and America, to the Western countries to take asylum. But you know, in a way that's great for them, isn't it? They get to stay in these developed countries and their life is kind of sad after that. I wouldn't say it's that much simple. And you know, in, in another way, it must be so much easier for you to apply for scholarships or fellowships and get admission. I mean, it's an open secret. They always prefer ethnic minorities. I must say I'm a little jealous, actually. I'm Mohini from India. I could have been from anywhere because my story is as universal as it's personal. It's the story of a strong guru. I would see my mother drudgingly wearing the scars of an incompatible marriage every day, performing the unfailing rituals of cleaning, cooking, sweeping, mopping, crying, choking, keeping quiet and fighting to live. I would see my granny trudging on the path of a failed marriage, desperately collecting the shards of bitter, incisive conversation, dressing them up as soulful conversations and penning them in her poems about a soulful marital relationship which she wrote with a bleeding ink. They both would tell me, smile and be strong Shh, like we are. And I, I thought that strength lays in resili resili resilience, that strength lay in resilience in bouncing back, in fighting back tears, in smiling through thick and thin, and in keeping quiet. But today, today, as I lay half conscious, wincing in an incisive pain, diving deep to fish out the last ounce of bread, and losing the sense of my numb limbs, I feel an urge to shout, to shout with my remaining breath and to tell the world that silence, silence gave my mother tuberculosis, silence left my granny with an un 
with a failing, ailing heart. And silence has pushed me hard into the abyss of anxiety. I want to shout and tell the world that being a strong woman hurts. So Annie's picture accompanied with an article in the Sea Weekly, which is always worth picking up. An article by Noah, who studies in the Nationalism Studies program, and who noted in his article that these posters about George Soros are similar to the laughing Jew propaganda of the Nazi era. So their photo and writing uh, became part of my story, part of the way I experience life. And let me zoom in a bit on what you see. Some of you may know all the contextual details, some of you may know less. Let me just mention that a uh, wonderful writer, Istvan Kemi, uh, wrote in an essay that Hungary received a fairy tale chance from history at some point, and that fairy tale chance was that one million Jewish people was living in Hungary, and here it may be worth adding that Istvan is not Jewish Hungarian himself so not Jewish himself, but he appreciates very much the contributions of Jewish Hungarians and then he wrote in the essay that Hungary had a chance to write itself to the history books for, forever in a positive way, but it failed to do so when it, it was not able and not willing to defend if Jewish citizens. And this is part of the picture that you see what Rani did in the Jewish cemetery at Szeged, South East Hungary. And what matters here especially that it's countryside Hungary. And when it's countryside Hungary, for those of you who don't know, that means that systemic deportation almost fully cleaned up Hungary from Jewish Hungarians, and many Roma Hungarians were also killed, while Budapest is the place where deportation was stopped. So many uh, Jewish Hungarians, much more many survived here. So this is, this is a crucial part of the context of this story, because it means that the Jewish graves over which Rani as a history student at CU, captured the photo about George Soros, uh, symbolizes that in the countryside those graves can be seen also as the graves of all those Jewish Hungarians who were around in almost every village. And they are not around any longer. And I'm not saying it only to state this extremely sad fact, I'm saying because I think that all these things are also giving us opportunities for making a response to engage reflection and counter speech. And although you may wonder how can we respond when the government with using lots of public money are putting up posters like this, I do have an idea. I have an idea of how to respond because I think that the memory of the victims of the Hungarian Holocaust, including the Roma Holocaust, creates a requirement for us. So just one time, um, I just follow up on my story here. This one time I, I went on a vacation. Actually, it was after 
after high school uh, graduation, we were celebrating with, um, with a group of girls. Some of them were my close friends, some of them I just met there. And we were having a real fun time. And um, well, this was five or six years ago, so I don't remember it, uh, every detail of it. But uh, we were sitting around the table uh, talking about something. And uh, one girl just said, I hate Jews. And um, I, I, I was just so surprised. I, I, I was living in the dream world, I thought. Anti-Semitism that doesn't exist anymore in Hungary, maybe in rural areas, maybe some older people. But I was so surprised, I said, are you kidding, right? I mean, I'm one-fourth a Jew. And my grandparents were Jew. And um, she responded, no, I'm not kidding. And um, the whole situation, no one, little did I know that one of the other girls uh, was actually a religious Jew, but no one, everyone just remained silent. And it was such an awkward situation, or, or I felt embarrassed, that's the right word, that um, I just decided to not to continue this debate. Coming from one of the most dangerous cities in the world in terms of urban violence and, cr and crime rates in Carac uh, Car I mean Caracas, Venezuela, I, I had never been robbed there, but I was uh, robbed in Budapest. They pickpocketed my wallet here in a tram, so uh, it happens. So I went to the police and I reported the crime, and then less than a month later, I was very surprised by the efficiency of the. Hungarian police, they, they, they told me that they caught the robbers and that they had, I needed to have an interview in the police department. So I went there and then <laughs> they told me, oh, we caught the robbers. It was a, a, a gypsy couple. I was like, oh, okay, really? And, they, and then they told me, oh, they, you know that they, they are not real Hungarians. They, they came from India, you know, so that's why this doesn't happen here. But, you know, they are not Hungarians. And then, then I was having an interview, and uh, I, I explained to the policewoman how dangerous uh, was Venezuela in terms of crime, and that the police would never find a wallet, and they would never bother to find a wallet. So I, I said congratulations to them, and uh, and well, uh, they, and I, I explained to her to her the situation in my home country, and she told me, oh, why are you doing a PEC? Why don't you stay here in Hungary? You, you should, you, you, you could come and teach in our universities. Anyways, and I like your language. I'm learning Spanish. Anyways, you are not, you are not a refugee. You're, you're not a Muslim. You can stay here. pays off. People tend to like you more and do things for you more. Nobody likes to hear what they do wrong. There's this phenomenon of killing the messenger. That's what people prefer to do. It helps with introducing the order of infallibility. Order of infallibility. It kind of makes sense. It's something like when you're a god and you finish cleaning your godly kitchen and suddenly there's a, there appears a bug, dirty bug, and you squash it. You just must squash it. Dehumanization is an important part of it and disgust. More than being angry and disgusted, I am afraid of people. By now I learn from whom I should be afraid of, who are the ones who can hurt me, even when they do not intend to. I learn who are the ones who have the power to do so. Marginalized people learn this very, very early, and they learn too well the cost-benefits analysis of silence and speech. Speaking will make you suffer if it is targeting what it should, if it matters. After you have spoken in a way that matters, 
you will pay some price. Alternative, of course, is living with your silence, angry and disgusted with yourself, until your body says no. This is why black American people, Roma people, and especially Roma women often suffer from lack of self-respect, die younger, and from stress-related illnesses in greater numbers. So, no matter what your phenomenological and ontological status of consciousness and mental health might be, I cannot think people would not feel shitty after they were treated like shit, and they did nothing but just smiled. You pay the price, one way or the other. My mother assimilated so well into the male-dominated electric engineering that I have sometimes the feeling that even she, dis she has a tendency to discriminate me. Not on purpose, though. Early in her childhood, being the second daughter in a rural environment with a Will Smith father and a full-time mom, she had to set up survival techniques fast. My grandmother had eight children to raise. The first five of them were, for their bad luck, all girls. One can imagine how hard it is, how hard you have to struggle to prove that you are almost as worthy as a boy if you are the first, the second, the third, the fourth and the fifth girl in a countryside family in Havash, a place famous for its watermelon fields where all working hands were needed in times of harvest. My mother was the second girl. With her sisters, she also had to do agricultural work besides school as a child but for girls, picking melon was too heavy duty. The first boy, when he arrived as a sixth child, had problems on the other end, due to the overwhelming expectation for being a boy after so many girls. My, f my grandfather got as drunk when he was finally born, but my uncle didn't feel loved by them nevertheless. Being a first granddaughter of them was a different experience. My otherwise strict grandfather could smile at me and tell stories whenever we visited them. But I've gone too far in family history, though it is somehow related to everything what I am today. Oh, I don't think I trust you anymore. You're missing out on life. Are you kidding? You're not? Are you crazy? I only have three orders and there are four of you. Is everything all right? Come on, learn to live a little. I don't drink. Do you see this Google map? You might think that it's geotagging for some fancy locations or some cafes in my city. But this is actually the number of incidents that has happened in my city against my community. This entire area is not more than 40 square kilometers. And more than 1,500 people have been killed. By the perpetrators who think that they are better Muslims than my community. People from every segment of the society have been affected. Politicians, community leaders, an Olympian boxer, a singer, and an artist. But those were real people, not merely some statistics. Those were real people, men, women, and children, having hopes and dreams of better future in their eyes. But those dreams were shut down by those murderers. Today, I'm going to bring one of those, one of those people who were killed on two, in 2011, during the most holiest day in the Islamic calendar, the day of Eid, the 10-year-old Sherali. His father describes to Human Rights Watch, In the morning, I heard the blast and rushed to help. I was not worried about Sherali. I thought he was at home or at my sister's. After that, we came back around midday, I went to say my prayers and sent 
my son to look for the other children. At that time, there was an announcement from the mosque. They said, the bodies of a 65-year-old man and a 10-year-old boy were lying there. I went here to see who it was, and my son was lying there, dead. He had been hit by pellets in the neck, in his eyes, on the head as well as the hands and the lower abdomen. One of his legs was broken, but there was no mistaking. He was my sherry. He was bright and cheerful young boy, 10 years of age. He was my favorite. I had brought him up myself since the death of his mother. He was studying in grade four and was also learning Quran. Everybody who knew him loved him. Why did they have to kill him? What, did, what have we done? Why did the government allow my son to die? And tomorrow? So will I die. So will we all. And when the chief minister of the province was asked, why you are not doing anything for the bereaved community, he said, I can send them a truckload of tissue paper so that they can wipe their tears. A law enforcement personnel, when asked by the Human Rights Watch that why you are not doing anything to protect the community, they said they want to get killed so that they can get asylum. And 2015, the Chief Minister was asked again why this continuous agony of this community, the Sori saga of the Hazaras are not ending. He replied, they want to remain in isolation. We cannot escape these pictures. They may make us speechless, but we cannot escape them. So what do we do about them? I myself trust in words. I trust in the power of words. I trust in the power of <coughs> speech. And, and I trust that the most powerful is speech, speaking the truth, which is not just a subjective truth, but which is really grounded on, on something like the moral requirement that I mentioned. And that moral requirement is that if a genocide happened in a country, then the community of the country and the whole world has a moral requirement at least to respect the memory of the victims. And practical decisions follow, in my belief. And of course, part of what would follow that such posters should be knocked up around the country. So I'm probably not the only one who think about going out there and taking them down somehow but that may be a challenge. But we have right here part of something which can be done. And this is about this university where this artistic counter speech to hatred has been going on. And this university was founded, as I already said, by a Hungarian Holocaust survivor and this university has been working almost for its whole history in Budapest which is full of Hungarian Holocaust survivors in the middle of a country where there are not so many 
Holocaust survivors other than Budapest for the reason I mentioned. So the relevant moral requirement is, in my deep belief, that the respect for the memory of the victims of the Hungarian Holocaust require that this university stays in Budapest. This is a truth. This is a simple truth in my belief and this truth cannot be rejected by any tricky uh, viciousness, by any fear which cannot step over its own shadow and by any underappreciation of the richness of the culture in Central Europe and Hungary. This is a truth that everybody has to respect and besides everybody, in my belief, also the Hungarian government must respect it. And I may surprise you and you may think that I am making here the Guinness record of being naive, but I, notwithstanding the posters that you see above me, I trust that this Hungarian government will also respect this truth. That, again, the memory of the victims of the Hungarian Holocaust, among other things, require that a university founded by a Hungarian Holocaust survivor, working most of the time in Hungary since its foundation, must stay in Budapest. They will respect this requirement. I trust them, they will do. Now, just to end the story with a happy note, I, um, I just wanted to assure you this uh, didn't really affect me in any kind of negative way. After quite a few days of very awkward moments, silences, I, um, I decided to really um, reveal this part of my family history, which was really, uh, really brutal, I think, and this formerly very minor part of my identity became really stronger. So I just, I just talked to my grandpa about about stories uh, of the labor camp in war and um, about uh, about stories. Uh, read a lot of poetry of uh, Miklos Radnoti, who was um, um, who was also. Um, in turn, the same camp, and uh, and well, I I think I really succeeded to embrace this part of my identity, and I I really encourage you to do so as well. Once I took a Hungarian girl for a, for a date to a to a wine bar, and I was telling her how I like how. How much I like Hungary and her country and this city and the wonderful experiences that I have had here, but I told her one thing: like I, you know, there is there are two things that I would only take away from from Hungary, only two things, or perhaps one, one thing is the uh, is the pessimism and the sadness of many of many Hungarians that they, they show in public, and then. Uh, she, she answered, she, she replied, I would only take away one thing from Hungary. I would take away gypsies. Voice is a powerful thing. Language is a powerful thing. Words, words, words put us in danger and they save us. They also make bridges. They allow us to know about other people's internal states. You realize that you would never really know how the world appears to a Roma woman 
or a black person or LGBT people if they are, uh, and how it actually treats them if they would not speak, often paying the great price. However, notice though that it's not that every person which speaks about these issues necessarily pays much of a price. Some actually le learn to maneuver when and how to speak just about enough so that nobody's feelings are hurt. So that nobody's feelings are hurt. Hurt. It hurts. So they do not pay too much of a price because you pay price. Even to profit from this kind of talk which does not really matter. The talk which does not really matter. The talk which does not really matter. It makes me angry, this talk which does not really matter. They would surely call it differently. <clears throat> I just call it bullshitting. So anyway, um, I know that better off people do not know how it is to be that other, even when it happens in front of their eyes, their eyes, their eyes, their eyes. Even when it happens in front of their eyes. I also know how they use that as an excellent excuse, also. So anyway, I hope you see now quite educated, better off people who debate academically, theoretically, objectively, and decently about other people's lives, what is offered right here. You get these expensive parts of our lives cut in vivo now without a price for you. So, it's again on us. Audrey Lord said, the fact that we are here and that I speak these words is an attempt to break that silence and bridge some of those differences between us. For it is not differences which immobilize us, but silence. And there are so many silences to be broken. That is what she said. Now I keep asking myself every time when the silence is broken and people feel uncomfortably faced with their privileges, what would they do? Would they listen when it matters? What would you, white, educated, better off, privileged people do. I've been always keen on fulfilling expectations. Being the eldest child and the girl especially. I married the person who was around at the time when I thought it was expected to get married, preparing to go for a diplomatic mission abroad. What eventually didn't prove to be the best decision, as we got divorced shortly after the birth of my first child, because I was not willing to submit myself to a macho style attitude, pushing women to stay at home and there almost mostly in the kitchen, or taking care of other children at best. Even if I like to cook, it becomes much less attractive when someone tries to limit me to this. Then I started to think about what I really want for myself. In the Hungarian Foreign Ministry, where I used to work, it was questionable whether a woman can really advance a career, even if there are a lot of women working there, but they are getting rare at the level of head of department or higher, not to speak of the ambassadors. By the time I was working there, we had around 5% women head of missions. Furthermore, we live now in a country where our prime minister explicitly said that politics is not for women, as it is too hard for them. I guess it's because he doesn't happen to know personally my mother. <laughs> By now, my private life has changed a lot. I have a much less mature husband who happens to be German and who accepts me the way I am. And for whom it's a natural thing that both we do housework whenever necessary, even if we don't like it always. He has even come here to the hate speech monologue. Now I do more unconventional things. Having another baby over 40, 
than even going back to studying here, and I'm proud of it. I think that if you really want something, no matter how hard it is or how long it takes, you should go for it. Maybe I should even try to go for politics. After all, I should be grateful to have such a strong role model like my mother. You're going against what nature intended. No wonder you look so weak. You just don't have the required nutrition. You stop being a disgrace to the human race. I'm bad You see this pamphlet? Probably it's in Urdu, it's in Urdu and you can't understand. It was widely distributed in my locality, which is turned into a small ghetto now. It reads, it was distributed by the terrorist organization and it reads, all Hazaras are worthy of killing. We will rid Pakistan of unclean people. Pakistan means land of pure and Hazaras have no right to live in this country. We have the edicts and signatures of revered scholars declaring Hazara Shias infidels. We will make Pakistan the graveyard of Shia Hazaras and their houses will be destroyed by bombs and suicide bombers. We will only rest when we will be able to fly the flag of true Islam on this land of pure. Jihad against the Hazaras has now become our duty. When I went outside of my country to different countries and also this thing I experienced in Hungary, not a lot of people knew about what was happening in my country with the Hazara community. And I was thinking about it, that why this is continuously happening and no one has ever witnessed in the international community. And more than answers, the, these were just questions in my mind. The question that is, half a million people in a population of 200 million, two less number of people to be considered important by the politicians to talk about. Is it that the enemy who is attacking is not from another country that the law enforcement agency and the military is not protecting? Is it that the perpetrators are not Israel or America for the Muslim Ummah to talk about it? Or is it that the only thing that we, can, that we have contributed to the international community is with our singers, artists, sportsmen, and not with some minerals and natural resources that we could grasp the attention of the international community. Let us not forget what Bell Hooks said. Personal is political. The memory of the victims of the Hungarian Holocaust requires that a university founded by a Hungarian Holocaust survivor stays in Budapest. As Arundhati Roy said, Let's not reconcile with violence and the ugly disparities of life around us. Dissent is patriotic. Happiness is after all your decision. Would I listen when it matters? Being vegetarian is more sustainable. Be proud of who you are.
Thank you so much for listening. Let me just quickly introduce the cast. Uh, Mohini. Ru. Antonio. Esther. Yelena. Ankita and Fanny and let me also thank Marina for helping with the slides and Adina, Adam and Peter with, with the recordings And Yelena and Carmen, who did posters for the performance. <laughs> and, and all others who helped, including Erwin and others with the classroom support. Thank you so much for coming. And now, uh, those who need to rush, please feel free. Those who have time, uh, please. Uh, uh, stay and raise some questions or provide some comments before we go to the reception where we can also continue conversation. So, uh, questions, comments? Anybody? Why? Why is this not all? So, um, yeah, in the meantime, I ask why you think about questions. Are there any questions I just don't notice? Or so please think about it. And in the meantime, I ask the performers whether whether any of you have some something to add about about your your performance or your experience in getting involved in this or or your motivation. Anybody? Oh, there is a question there. Is there a working? Is this mic working? Yeah, just press it. I have to work because I don't want to ask this question. Or it may not even be a question, but an argument. My name is Shadow Kerekesh, as you probably know it. And the question is somehow, and this identity and the politics of identity. Wouldn't you think, I put it into a question form so it makes it easier to deal with, wouldn't you think that uh, basic politics on identity is an actual recipe for disaster. I'm just coming now from Sabachatir where I spoke to the Elven, uh, Elven Amlet, the, the, the living memorial, about the racially or ethnically pure Hungary and its necessity as the Prime Minister presents it, which is an a, a gigantic idiocy and a, and, a, and a disagreeable notion altogether. But it is all about identity. So don't you think that politics of identity should be outlawed, forbidden, avoided at any cost? Identity has no place in politics. It should be a private matter. Identity should be private. Thank you for the comment. I asked the performers, whether you have any comment on this? Anybody? I, I made it, then I mentioned just very shortly, and I give the mic to Nietzsche in a second, that, that it's tricky, really challenging. In a way, I myself, when, I don't know, eight years ago, someone introduced me at CU saying that Peter is also Hungarian, and actually I corrected that person saying that 
I consider myself rather as a Central European, I said, as sort of an anti-nationalist. But then the current government produced so disturbing interpretations of what it means to be Hungarian that it sort of provoked me, as it happens in free discussion when we often hear very disturbing ideas, it, it provoked me in a way, even inspired me to, to, to formulate and talk about my own understanding of what it means to be Hungarian. And it seems to me that one, it's difficult to avoid it, because it still matters to people. Second, in our communities, if nothing else, of language and some shared histories, there are some, some senses of belongings. And it seems to me it matters a lot if we can create inclusive, positive understandings of what it means to belong to certain, certain groups. And not let to create only negative and exclusive understandings. But it's very tricky. A friend at CU, a professor, told me when I told him I started to uh, formulate my own understanding of what it means to be hungry, and he said, but that means that they won, because you go into some national identity issues. Anyway, it's a difficult issue. Thank you for raising it. Nirja. Hello, uh, I'm Nijhar. I'm, uh, I'm a student from West Bengal, Kolkata, India. And I'm studying in the one-year MA program in political science. Actually, this is not really a question. It's a kind of response to what Sir said a couple of minutes ago. That uh, while it's true that uh, if politics is broken down to identities, it will inevitably lead to uh, such kind of uh, problematic politics. However, uh, some things should be seen that if we say that we will see everybody as human and uh, not of a particular group, white or black, uh, Hungarian or Roma or like um, Muslim or Christian, we will not do this. Uh, that is very much good and uh, desirable to one extent. However, because of systematic discrimination that has been going on for hundreds or sometimes even thousands of years, some people, uh, uh, some groups of people based on identity, they are, they are in a much, um, much disadvantaged predicament at the moment. So if, the, if you just say that we'll say everyone is human, uh, there can be no identity based assertions then uh, what will happen is that again this idea of doing away with identity politics uh, that will only help the privileged privileged groups in society I mean if women cannot claim uh, maternity leave um, because we'll treat all employees equally or if like in India uh, people from the lower castes cannot claim reservations because uh, because everyone is equal or if uh, like some other uh, or if like um, African Americans cannot claim certain entitlements um, b b because of their skin color then then what will happen is that in the name of equality the the social patterns of what has been existing for the hundreds or thousands of years that same pattern will most likely to be reproduced. Now, uh, I understand that what I'm saying is tricky, but, but it also needs to be seen with nuance. For example, that, uh, uh, for example, uh, like I was in a, in a conference in India around two years ago, and uh, here was this, uh, was this lady who was giving a presentation on uh, her book on the genocide of the Bengali people in East Pakistan which has now become Bangladesh 
and now um, she complained that some some oh, when she, her book was releasing in some part of america uh, some people actually disrupted the program or the, um, something like that and uh, their idea was that such kind of narratives shouldn't be put because pakistan being a muslim country it puts forward some kind of an islamophobic narrative now that kind of thing is also very problematic um, and then like uh, in india in india we are going through a very tough tough um, situation especially for the past 3 years at least for the past 3 years uh, where we have an ultra nationalist government in power which is which is passing uh, one draconian measure after the other uh, recently we had we had something like uh, in a very famous university in India, a Muslim student just disappeared from the campus. A Muslim student just disappeared from the campus. Now, if you treat that, and by the way, before that thing happened, uh, there, he, he faced some Islamophobic remarks in some altercations. Now, if we say that the identity of that boy doesn't matter, the identity of that boy doesn't matter, that boy being Muslim, that doesn't matter. You are living in some kind of fool's paradise. Similarly, if you say that the that people from oppressed communities they cannot use they cannot use the name of the community, and if you deride them by saying that they are playing the victim card by using their identity card, that is in some way perpetrating and reinforcing privileged ideas. So I think this needs to be seen in a very nuanced manner. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Niachar, for these thoughtful comments. And while, uh, while you think about further, or I'm asking, are there further comments, questions? I just mentioned two more names. I forget, I'm sorry, that, that uh, Sarah uh, very helpfully uh, took photos at rehearsals and provided comments and also Zivar. So two other wonderful students, I want to recognize their help and contribution as well. So uh, any other questions, comments, any other comments from the cast? Or we Somebody is in the back? <laughs> There, here. Hello, thank you so much for your speeches. We um, recently had a course in epistemology, and then we tried to find out what truth was. And it's pretty hard, actually, to find out what it is. And I just wanted to say um, that I came across this really wonderful speech of someone, and I wanted to share this this idea of this woman who said, it's not to be right, it's to be righteous. And I think that's so beautiful. Like, you don't have to be right, you just want to be righteous. You want to speak up for people that can't, or just do whatever. And I really think you did that this evening. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And, oh, at the very back. Um, hi, it's just a comment, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a Muslim majority, Sunni Muslim majority Pakistani, and I would just like to say that I am the possessor of probably one of the worst passports in the world. So at the airport, I've been uh, taken out of lines, and people have actually stared at me scandalized, saying, Oh my god, she's going to blow up soon. Or something like that. So I'd just like to share this example of hate speech and sort of like implicit hate speech. Thank you very much for mentioning that. I give the mic there. Just let me comment on here that I wanted to emphasize anyway that, again, uh, the content of this performance always depends on which CU students are coming forward and, and say that I would perform, I will share my stories and my reflections. So it really depends on you. So if you perhaps wonder that if some viewpoints or some subjects may have been more represented today than other subjects, it always depends 
depends on, on the student community and uh, at CU and, and I would like to encourage you as well to think about performing in March and sharing your stories with one of, maybe a title for your story can we put sometimes titles on the posters uh, Worst Passport on Earth <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, first of all, congratulations for continuing the tradition of CU. And I want to congratulate every each performer for sharing their feelings at heart with us. And I think the fact that you reveal your story with us would uh, be a step forward to make stronger and more cohesive this community. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Now, identity issue. It's an old story. And I want it not to answer to the person that raised the question, but to be reflexive. And I will start with armed conflict, a historical view, if you look, it was exactly because of the identity of the otherness. The enemy created there by religion, by color of their uh, uh, skin, by different habits. It was a time when the wor world was shared with the, and it is global north, global south. So shall we put this aside and to pretend that the politics or policies are colorblind. blind. History it tells us no. Second, leave the, the historian look at our days. How we can ignore, just inspiring the, the colleague of ours, to look uh, as colorblind blind at the so-called securitization policies which they are mainly targeting color, passport, religion, uh, region from where you come. How we can pretend and not speak out about this, saying that yes, security is for our uh, goodness, but it's colorblind, which is not true. How we can look at the school segregation that yes, the right to education is a universal right and we shouldn't debate where the Roma kids are put in or uh, uh, where the, the migrant kids are put it in a school just because uh, naturally we have the human rights and right to education is universal. And the uh, 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 examples continue. But last point that I wanted to say. Politics is exactly about the otherness. Politics, it looks at their identity. Politics, it's using the identity of the others, doesn't matter if it's a, a ideological or geographical, color scheme, uh, religion, beliefs, even the basic thing of uh, civilized, uncivilized nation. I think it's a wrong paradigm to believe that politics and policies are colorblind. No, we have to talk and we have to challenge and we have to adjust what is needed. It's a continuous fight. Thank, thank you, Marius, for, for your thoughtful comments. And others, I'm, please tell me if I don't notice someone. And uh, while I'm searching, I, I ask you again to, uh, yeah, there is a hand here, so I'm coming, just not to forget, I ask all of you again to find me, approach me to friends or otherwise, or uh, just catch me on campus if you would like to share stories in the next performance, and, uh, and uh, or if you know others who would. Hello, thank you for your contributions. And I'd like to raise something that is probably contentious, but I'd like to offer it in the way of cautionary tale, perhaps. There was a student that I had, Toronto, Canada, um, 
who was a former child prostitute and who had worked her way up, you know, piece by piece, brick by brick, um, up to the college level. And she was in the social work department. And there was an infusion of feminism, of white privilege, which is what I'd like to address right now. And more than once she said to me, in my capacity as a teacher, how am I privileged? In what way does my background entitle me, if that's the word we can use here, to the status of privilege? And she felt obviously quite the contrary. Um, there are white people walking around, whether they are children or grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. If we look back, we can say people who went through the famine in Ukraine, people who were oppressed enormously in Russia, there, there's, there's a substantial list. So my feeling is, I am wondering if it's a quid pro quo, which I would like to see, that the white person is not automatically identified as a person of privilege, and that leads to things which are far more disparaging than just person of privilege. But that person is also a human being with all kinds of different backgrounds as well. It's a plea for that. Yeah, thank you very much for this thoughtful comment as well. And at this point, I also ask the performers again whether they would have some comments. Let me just, I'm trying to add things not to forget. I should have mentioned earlier that, that there is a website that Timothy Garton, as who was a wonderful speaker at the Rector's, Michael Ignatieff's thoughtful series on right thinking open society, that website is called freespeechdebate.com. Mm -hmm. And just yesterday they published and I hope it doesn't sound like shameless self-promotion. I just want to call of attention on the article that I wrote a short piece on that about this performance and how I believe that art with courage of thought, which also questions our own beliefs, is the strongest response to hatred, in my view. So I just wanted to call your attention on it and in the similar piece, I wrote a short one in Hungarian on Harvey.au, also about the anti short process. So I just, for further thinking, I wanted to call your attention on these writings. But now, so performers, yeah, no, no, yes, I was guessing that you will have some comments. Yeah, so, um, so what, what, I, I think that all of us here probably uh, would subscribe to intersectionality approach to this issue. So, uh, Neither of us, I guess, I, I'm going to guess this, that would say that there is no uh, white person which has its own issues. There are white poor people, I don't know, white disabled people, uh, there are LGBT white people, um, uh, different kinds of... Uh, you're not addressing what I'm saying, and I, I think I need to interject here, sorry. Because you're talking about those kinds of groups. Sorry, I'm let me the about mic. Yeah. Sorry, let me give the <laughs> mic just for the, that we have. I'm sorry to do this, but yeah, I think this is Hello. Uh, what I'm addressing, the, ones, the examples that you are giving are the categories of people anywhere in the world who get discriminated against. What I am talking about would be those white people who are former child prostitutes, who had terrible upbringings, who had situations of running away for freedom, you know, running away from persecution towards, who have been terribly discriminated against in their country. It's a different kind of categorization. Yeah, okay, okay. so uh, let's, let's agree on this account that it's a different categorization. I don't think it's different, but uh, let's say it's different, you know. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that oh, it's Okay, in other words, if an LGTB, LG <laughs> person walks down the street, and they are white, I am not going to notice them if I may be colored or chi you know, Chinese or something or black. I may only see them as quote unquote a person of privilege because they are white. That's the point that I'm getting at. If you can understand what I'm saying. There is no identifiable marker on that person other than that he's white and ergo he is a person of privilege. Yeah. What I would like to take away from this is that there can be a host of things which take away, if you will, 
the privilege of that individual. They are not an idol, a god, per se. We don't know. Look, I mean, um, on my account, I, I would say that any kind of this uh, things that you're, like, whiteness of your skin is just like a contingent factor of your birth. You're not, uh, this is not something that you should be blameworthy. You know, you're not blamed because uh, you are born with this kind of situation. So, of course, you're not blameworthy because you're white, just because you're white. White privilege is not about that, as I see it. Like, white privilege is uh, that you consider uh, that in society you have certain kind of benefits because of this contingent factor of your birth and to be aware that you have this privilege just because you're white. This is, yeah, uh, 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 this is what I think of, uh, when I think about white privilege. And that white people usually are not aware of these privileges. And that, uh, and they usually feel, you know, offensive, like, oh, I'm not, you know, it's not my fault, I was born like this. Of course you were born like this. Nobody talks about that, like, you know. People talk about social conditions and the systems, social systems, in which you are privileged because of this contingent factor. So I don't, I'm not sure if I'm making sense. Um, and uh, in, the, in this way, uh, you're privileged because if you have this kind of a person who is marginalized or you know suffered a lot of these kind of things, and in a relative term, you compare this with the person, let's imagine that there is a double, you know, that this person is on all the grounds the same with some black person, like, you will still have an advantage. Because poor people, you, if they are Roma people, for example, who are poor, and non-Roma people who are poor, like, they still have this advantage in society. Because, for example, in my country, like in Serbia, uh, the poorest people are Roma, and they are like 10 times more you know, the poorest uh, white per I mean, non Roma person is like, you know, 10 times less poor than than, non than Roma person. So, uh, yeah, I hope I make sense. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away from me. Thank you. Um, I, it just came to my mind that uh, I come up again with my mother, <laughs> as I do all, the, all evening. Actually, my experience was I. I was not so sure whether I want to present uh, because I'm white, I'm European, whatever. And uh, then I, 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 of course, Peter was a, was a little bit insisting. We met a few times, and then I started to write, and it came out that uh, my story is more about my mother than about me. And uh, she had a very nice uh, comment to this to one of the employees who started to say, uh, like, blame Roma people, and then, because she also, we, she also tries to employ Roma people sometimes, and then to this guy who said something wrong about Roma, he said, so, how did you arrange that you were not born a Roma? <laughs> Which was a very nice uh, attitude. And I would like to take the floor also to thank Peter, uh, because I think that uh, this opportunity that you create uh, from year to year to uh, give floor to people to express uh, express their thoughts on this issue or whatever they they uh, they experience and especially I was very much moved by your story I have never haven't heard your story before and I even thought what am I doing here when you have such a story from Pakistan and I was kind of uh, hmm. I thought I should go off stage <laughs> because it's really tough, and it's it's really a privilege to to be among you and then to be here and it's this is a great occasion to have this okay feeling that is the basis that you are accepted into the community and then you are just no matter how old you are where where you are from uh, you are a woman or a man so there are all kinds of discriminations possible if you are a minority, and I think it's a great job, and you're doing good to take this out of the people. So thank you again. <laughs>
And this is also probably, oh, sorry, this is also probably to acknowledge our own uh, privileges also for, you know, having an opportunity to be here at all. I mean, like in my country, like only 10% of people has uh, higher education, even less like MAs, and even less is the ones who can come into this kind of institution and whatever. And uh, in this kind of sense, like we're all like underprivileged and privileged in some, in some relative terms. So I, I would say like I'm Roma and uh, I'm coming from a very poor background. My mom is like a cleaning lady um, and I'm the first in my generation to have like a high school even. Um, and I'm actually the first one probably on this philosophy department here from the moment in, from when it started. Uh, probably in Europe, <laughs> I don't know. But, um, so, so you can imagine that uh, in that sense, but I'm still very privileged to be here uh, compared to other people, other Roma. Yeah. I'm actually answering the question which was raised in the discussion which was going on. I think uh, the very motive of having something like this is to realize and to understand that you know there is a world beyond binaries and often like our immediate reaction to a lot of things basically is to have a vision of the distant other which is why like you know we start disconnecting ourselves with some of the most pertinent issues which are happening with people from other communities, societies by looking oneself as like you know as the prejudiced other and they could be anybody, it could be a white man, a Roma woman, a Asian ma an Asian man, an a member from the LGBT community, it could be anybody. So I think in that sense we need to realize that you know, we have to move beyond the boundaries of being exploited and privileged and realize that intersectionality is the key. Everybody has had an experience, everybody has had a history of being violated. The extents, the way, like you know, they could vary, they could be different. But the question here is not to prove that you know, like whose pain has been more profound. The idea is to have an empathy around others' pain and understand that there can be a political and historical context behind the struggles of certain communities, which has to be talked about, which has to be appreciated. Which is why we need to realize that hatred does not only really lie in the speech. It lies in the very gauge, it lies in the actions, it lies in the movements, it lies in every single word we speak out of our own privileges or our own deprivations. And I think which is why dialogue is really important to get over the notion of the distant others and to realize that empathy is really required to understand what is happening around us and within ourselves. No, then. Would you permit me to add yes, a small yes, note? Yeah, there, there speaks the woman of the Mayan heart. And uh, it, it, is, it is obvious that most of us, most of you, are uh, protesting against this kind of discrimination versus that kind of discrimination. And the only thing I would like to say is that we here in Hungary have the most brilliant, the most brilliant example of discrimination and nationalism uh, run amok, a reductio ad absurdum. We have a real big party and its European members of parliament who are so nationalistic and so discriminating against everybody that even the discriminators, the members of the European parliament who are themselves nationalists, reject these people. They wouldn't accept it, uh, wouldn't accept this party amongst their members. So, Morvei Kristina, one of these members of Leobik, sits alone because there is no, com no caucus that would accept her. She's so noxious to everybody. This is how far the thing can go down uh, to, 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 to absurdity. Thank you for that comment, and let me make sure probably close soon and go to the reception, but I don't want anybody to and now to have the chance to speak at least shortly, uh, if you wish. And I, let me just, while you think quickly whether you have something to say or the, add that, add that uh, I think it was a very interesting discussion both about the issue of national identity and, and privilege. And uh, I hope that this performance helps us think 
and engage in self-reflection also about our own prejudices that we may not have recognized. And it seems to me that recognizing each other's sort of sets of identities or complex backgrounds is also important what I quote in this freespeechdebate.com article Timothy Gartonesh who wrote in his who wrote in his book on free speech in a connected world that that we really need to make the strongest effort we can to listen to each other and that also means that we have to understand the complex background which is the ground for each of us to use a vocabulary to understand the terms we are speaking with. So if we don't hear each other's stories, we just cannot translate what the other is saying. So I, I, I think it's really important. And I, I also quote in this piece our rector, Michael, and he writes about Isaac Berlin, that Isaac Berlin, for him, conversation was never like his putting up a show, like, okay, I give a speech, but it was about being in company, being in conversation, being in an engagement to listen to each other and learn from each other. So any closing comments, questions? <laughs> yes, yeah, no. you Yeah, just a short um, I would say, uh, just uh, on this topic, that um, you're not, not blameworthy for, for your uh, contingent factor of your birth, like your, uh, where you're born and uh, what is the color of your skin and stuff like that. Does this work? No, no, it doesn't. So, um, this is what I want to say, that it's not really uh, about, like, uh, that you're not blameworthy for that. Uh, but in a matter that you know that the system which privileges you because of these factors exists, and that you know that this is the state of affairs, and if you don't do anything about it, then you are to be blameworthy. So in that sense, I think this is like a morale of this, uh, from my point, you know. It's like when you listen and you hear other people and how they suffer and whatever, uh, and you realize what are these like structural things happening and the society which in which we live on if you know all this and then you do nothing basically then it's in the domain of, of your your blame and you're blameworthy in that sense Maybe. Yeah. yeah so thank you Elena any other comments also perhaps from those performers who haven't spoken yet I don't mean to push anybody. Okay, then Nijar, very short <laughs> comment. I'm, I'm not pushing you to be short, just because people may be up no. for. Like, uh, see, so nobody would like to be treated badly or discriminated against. So, um, like, we should all try to empathize with others. And uh, while, uh, like, as Yelena said, that. Uh, Nobody has chosen the contingent conditions of his or her birth, like uh, race, race, religion, or nationality, or all these things. But we should also understand that these conditionalities, uh, these conditionalities, have been the factors on which people have been and are still getting discriminated. So while we should push for equality, we should try to empathize that certain people have on these unjust grounds been um, attacked, discriminated. So empathize and uh, show solidarity and try to make a better future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for everybody. And the reception is uh, outside in another 13 lobby. And uh, there is a table in the middle of the big hall, and there will be some stuff on it in a few minutes, maybe two or three. We just need to take it out. So please hang around if you can, and then let's continue the conversation out there. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for everybody also who have. Thanks, thanks.
And don't forget, think about your performance for March. Everybody is a performer. Just you don't know yet, perhaps. Thank you for the comment. Yeah, yeah, this will happen again in March, right? <laughs> Peter, this will happen again in March, right? Yes. Yeah. I will try to perform in March. Well done.